be praised. How many know that God is good? Amen. It's Wednesday, y'all, and we halfway there. Come on, give God praise. He's worthy of glory. He's worthy of honor. He's worthy of praise, and we bless him for who he is. Listen, there's a little song that says, I praise your name. 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 Not just today, but always, now and forever. song that simply talk about the praises of God and give them him praise. Oh my, not just today, but always, I praise his name. Y'all ready? Come on, I praise. I praise your name. Come on, I praise your holy name. Come on, say. I praise your name, your holy name. I praise your name. Not just today. Not just today. But always. But Enjoy. 
and know he's worthy and we praise his name. And because we praise him, Lord, I love you. Yes, I love you. How I love you, Jesus. I really love you. Anybody love him tonight? Woo! Lord, I love you. Yes, God, I love you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. Tell him how I love you. How I love you. Tell him I really love you. I really love you. Come on, I know y'all got it. Come on and join in and say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. Done so many things, oh God. How I love you. I really love you. Yes, I do. I really love you. This is why. Just for who you are. Just for who you are. In all of your glory. In all of your glory. Come on, tell it. My heart sings. Holy, 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 holy. Listen, tell him, you are everything. You are everything. I need you to be. I need you to be. You are the great I am. You are the great. Yes, you are. I am. Oh. I am.
Everybody say praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Minister Bynum. Let's show him some love and appreciation and all of these wonderful singers as God has given us the glorious, blessed privilege to gather at the close of what is already an incredible day, an amazing day. Let's give God praise here tonight. From the rising of the sun, to the going down of the same he is worthy. We have been mightily blessed by every preacher, presenter, and we are yet believing that every round goes higher and higher. Our God is so good simply because we are here with all kinds of gifts in this room, all kinds of talents in this place. And yet one thing with all of the gifts and talents that we have been blessed by God to have, one thing we cannot do is make a day. Only God can make a day. So will you stay on your feet? This is the day that the Lord hath made. We are here to rejoice and give God praise. Come on, let's one more time rejoice in the goodness of God for gifting us with the gift of a day. Dr. Hagans, Dr. Riddick, all of our wonderful leaders, we lift our voices to the glory of God. It's a highway to heaven. None can walk up there but the pure in heart. Words are going to be on our screens this evening. Following our opening hymn, the Reverend Walter Thomas Jr. is going to lead us to the throne of grace in prayer. First Baptist Church, Steelton, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Following the choral chant, Pastor Dr. K. Jerome Free. Mount Carmel Church, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, is going to lead us in the reading of God's holy word. Let, let's sing all over the house, all over the church. Amen.
Won't you reach out and hold somebody's hand? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Father and our God, tonight we stand in this sacred place. We stand in this auditorium transformed into sanctuary. Before we ask you for anything else, we first say thank you. God, we can never truly say thank you enough. So every chance that we get, every opportunity that we are afforded, we are the praises from our lips of thanksgiving for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. God, we're thankful, if for nothing else, one more day to be alive. We're thankful, God, for one more day to be in our right mind. We're thankful, God, that thus far everything the adversary has tried to do to take us out has failed. For that, God, we say thank you. God, we thank you for life, health, and strength, joy, peace, and happiness. God, we thank you for looking beyond our faults and still seeing us as worthy to lead your people. So now, God, tonight in this time of worship, let us do just that, worship your name. Let us magnify and edify and glorify your name. Tonight, God, in this sanctuary, let us lift up the name of Jesus Christ. For your word says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. So tonight, we come to lift Jesus higher. Tonight, we come to put his name on display. Tonight, we come to give you all the glory, honor, and praise that you are due. So God, speak in this place on tonight. Speak a word of transformation. Speak a word of healing. Speak a word of deliverance. Speak a word of breakthrough. Speak a word that breaks bonds and destroys yokes. God, as a matter of fact, I pray right now for the hand that I hold. Speak a word to my neighbor tonight, God. You know what they come here in need of. Give them a word of hope, God. Give them a word of peace. Give them a word of joy. Touch my neighbor on tonight. So when they leave here, they leave on fire, ready to go back and turn the world upside down. And right now, God, we take a moment of pause to speak to the adversary because we know he's eavesdropping. We declare the blood of Jesus Christ is in this house. So take your hands off of the people of God. Touch not God's anointed. Do his servants no harm. And any attack that you may throw our way, we declare tonight that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. So God, we praise you in advance. We praise you in the midst of it all. And we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, the church says, amen.
Hear the word of the Lord as recorded in the New Living Translation from 1 Kings, in the 17th chapter, and the first seven verses. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go to the east and hide by Kirith Brook near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you. I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped beside Kerith Brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. But after a while, the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Amen. Maybe seated at this time. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. How many of you have been blessed all day long? Amen. Amen. Dr. Harvey tonight to Reverend Hagins, to all of our leaders. I want to ask tonight that we would certainly respect our time together and the integrity of this conference. I want to pull on you and implore you that at the end of the message tonight, that you would not walk, but that we would all remain together to receive the benediction. I know the temptation of wanting to get to your vehicles early so that you can get ahead of the traffic but I believe we can all get out and uh, get out expeditiously and uh, preserve again the integrity of our gathering by not walking until the benediction is given. Will you do that tonight? Will you do that tonight? God bless you. I would hope that uh, if you have not purchased a copy of our president's book, Does Preaching Have a Future?, that you will make certain that you do. Again, I think that we owe a debt of gratitude to our president. Let's again show him some love and appreciation for the marvelous work that he continues to do in the way in which he leads us. To this wonderful audience, saints of God, I pause because three years ago this week, in fact, it was Friday of Hampton's Minister's Conference that uh, I laid with my family and ministers and friends at the New Shiloh Church in Baltimore to rest. The life of my father, Dr. Harold A. Carter. Three years have come and gone, and we still cherish his memory. I have to call his name since I have this microphone. Amen. Uh, he, was, he was one of the conference preachers Back in the 70s, those who may go back that far may even remember Honey Upon the Ground, a series that he preached as a part of this conference. In fact, my late mother as well, Dr. Webtonoma Carter, was the first female, although she was not a preacher, but she was the first female to speak at this conference under the late Dr. George Crawley. And so, the roots are deep, and 
now with my own son in ministry, Reverend Daniel Carter, even to generations following. When my father got to his 45th pastoral anniversary, the New Charlotte Church, I'd already come to befriend our preacher tonight. We first met during our days in this commonwealth years ago. And uh, our preacher and myself have been friends over the years. Thank God for Bishop Rudolph McKissick Jr. Amen. And how he has already shared the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ in our midst. But when my father was coming to planning his anniversary, now keep in mind, he's my friend. We are friends. But my father thought so highly of our conference preaching that uh, even with all of the colleagues and ministry that my father had over the years, that uh, he reached out to Bishop McKissick, Jr. to preach his 45th pastoral anniversary. That says a whole lot. And I praise God uh, for the fact that my father could always see something in a preacher, that a preacher was marked, that a preacher had a sign. I thought I would share that, but that's not the formal introduction tonight. The formal introduction of our preacher comes from Bishop Marvin Sack. And I want you to welcome him with great love as he comes to present our preacher, this Grammy Award winning singer and pastor of the Full Life, Lighthouse Full Life Center in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Come on, give him a good hand, a good hand, a good hand. Grace and peace to each and every one of you all. I am uh, I'm honored to have this opportunity to be here on tonight. And one of the main reasons why I'm honored is because I've heard so many things about this great conference. And this is my first time ever having the opportunity to come and to be a part of it. And I just honor the spirit of God. And I thank him for this wonderful opportunity to be able to stand in this capacity. I, I, I really don't have to introduce uh, this gentleman to you. The reason why I don't have to introduce him to you because if you were here on last night, he has already introduced himself. My, my assignment literally is to present him to you. I'm, I'm, I'm honored because I have the opportunity to serve with him in Global United Fellowship that's wonderful and that's fun. But the greatest honor that I have is the fact that he, being the only child, calls me one of his covenant brothers. There are those of us who are on a group chat together that we get the opportunity to encourage one another and strengthen one another and to make one another laugh they will never know how there are times when the group chat is going on and I'm silent that they say words via text that encourage me to fight on and to move on. I thank God for Tony. I thank God for Murphy. I thank God for Jay. And they're all wonderful individuals. But tonight, I want to present to you all a prolific pipe organist. I want to present to you all an operatic singer who is gifted in that area. I want to present to you all an individual that is an accomplished preacher, one that's going to give us a word that is going to set our lives aflame and afire. One thing I've learned in the short time that I've been alive is that if you come with the spirit of expectancy, that you're not going to leave here the same way you came. And I just wonder, is there anybody in here other than me that needs a word from the Lord? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't pay for 
a hotel room to leave the same way that I came. I, I, don't, I don't need sermon notes. I don't need any of those things. What I need is a word that's going to transition me and transform me into what he wants me to be. So listen, I'm done. I'm taking my seat. I need to present to you all none other than my friend, my brother, Bishop Rudolph McKissick, Jr. change oh change has come over me hallelujah he
look at your neighbor and tell him I'm not who I used to be. God, tonight we thank you for change. Thank you that we are still changing. Because we're not yet who you birthed us to be. Thank you for this sacred space. We give your name the worship tonight. We reverence you tonight for the total sufficiency of your Son and our Savior. We give thee thanks. Stand up in your servant now. Use my mind and my mouth for your glory. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou dost do. In the matchless, marvelous, majestic name of the Master, we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you, as you remain on your feet, to turn back to 1 Kings chapter 17. I want to read it again from the New King James Version because of some particularity of wording. While you're turning there, I'm honored tonight again by the wonderful president of this institution, Dr. Harvey. God bless you tonight, sir. Glad to see you again. We honor tonight my brother and the president of this wonderful conference, Dr. Dwight Riddick. We thank God tonight for the executive minister and also the campus pastor, Reverend Deborah Hagens. We bless God for her tonight. To my father, the man I love more than life, I'm so blessed to have him sitting by my side again. And to all of the former presidents of this wonderful conference, to all of the presenters, to my dearest friend in the world who is preaching with such authenticity and vulnerability in the morning, Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant. God, he blessed us this morning. I have to also recognize the gentleman who gives leadership to the musician side of this wonderful conference because before returning to Hampton as the director of choirs, he was the wonderful minister of music at the Bethel Church. And that is Omar Dickinson. And I thank God for him for the wonderful job that he does. First Kings chapter 17. Verse 1, now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the Lord of the Lord came to him, Depart from here, turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook that is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, bread and eat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Amen. You may be seated in God's presence. I want to preach tonight as the Spirit shall guide with this thought in our minds, the madness of ministry. The madness of ministry. Elijah was the first in a long line of important prophets that God sent to Israel and Judah. Elijah appeared in the land of Israel what was a very crucial time. The land of Israel was then divided into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of the ten tribes. On the throne of the latter sat a man by the name of Ahab. But the true ruler of the land was his wife, Queen Jezebel. 
originally a Phoenician princess who never gave up her Phoenician way of life. Her influence was very great, not just over him, but throughout the kingdom. And as a result, the worship of Baal, the god of the Phoenicians, spread with ever greater force. It was the cause of much trouble that befell the land of Israel. It is into this context of historicity that we are introduced to Elijah. What makes the calling of Elijah for me so strange is given to us right there in his biographical sketch. His biographical sketch is very interesting. He was a Tishbite from the land of Gilead. That's his resume. That is all we're given about the man who is touted by some as the most famous and dramatic prophet in Israel. Gilead is the area to the east of the Jordan River that was occupied by Israel from the time of Joshua. Now it's not known where Tishba was located, although that's never stopped map makers from trying to place it on the map or commentaries trying to make authoritative sounding statements about its location. But the reality is there is no firm as evidence as to where Tishba actually was other than in Gilead. So then, if that's true, God goes to the backside of nowhere and calls a nobody into an assignment. What a powerful yet simplistic statement. God goes to the backside of nowhere. What a statement in this day of chasing titles and collars. We're being called minister is not enough and your value is equal to your title. What can keep you humble is to know that God goes to the backside of nowhere, gets a nobody. I wanna to say to somebody tonight, if you never get a title, if nobody ever gives you an honorary degree, if you never earn a degree from an elite seminary if you pastor out in the country that only meets two Sundays out of the month if you never get to a stage called Hampton just know that you're still qualified because God specializes in going to the backside of nowhere and finding nobodies if the truth were told a whole lot of us in here are dressed up tonight but we could really shout because where we are is not where God found us the reality is for many of us he found us on the backside of nowhere and called us to do something on his behalf we, we know Elijah understands his role as a prophet because of how he starts off addressing the king he says to King Ahab as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand there shall be neither dew nor rain, except at my word. He was taking a swipe. No, he was throwing shade at the god Baal and those who worshipped him because Baal was celebrated as the god of fresh water and was said to be responsible for all meteorological activity. And that when the farmers wanted rain on their crops, they would bow at Baal for Baal to bring rain. And so what Elijah comes and says to them is, God of Israel is going to shut down the God you think controls everything to teach you that there's only one living and true God. What he says is, what God is going to show you is that what you've been trusting in has no power. He's going to shut down what you've been depending on and it won't happen again until he tells me to say so. Look at what Elijah does. He, he gives a word to the government about what God says. I'm in trouble. That the government doesn't dictate what happens. God does. God says, I'm about to do something that will show you who really has the power. That you might set the policies, but I have the power. That's, that's really what a prophet is. 
when, when you are a prophet, you say what God says when God wants it to be said. You stand on what God says. You proclaim what God says that sometimes contradicts what you see. And I'm preaching this tonight because we have become guilty of a diluted gospel to make profit instead of being prophets. In the words of Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright Jr., some of us have put price over principle and become prostitutes in the process. And it is in this diluted theology where sermons get sanitized and scriptures get edited. And one of the unfortunate, unfortunate things that has happened is that the preacher has tried to bend preaching so much towards being culture friendly that we have lost our spiritual integrity. God is looking for some men and women of God who are willing to stand up and combat the onslaught of the cultural takeover of the church that's making us relevant but irreverent. We are called to be prophetic, not performers. And to even make that suggestion in this modern day movement of the church bill is dangerous because unfortunately, those two words, prophetic and performance, seem to go hand in hand now. Now the prophet is seen as somebody who can call out the numbers of your checking account, tell you what your address is, because they looked on Facebook because you responded to the event I invite that you would be at the meeting. That's not being a prophet. The prophet stands in the midst of moral confusion to declare that God is with us in spite of everything that's going on. And I don't know about you, but that's good news tonight with the circus of politics that we see and everybody thinking we gotta make something great again. It's good to know that a prophet stands in the midst of confusion to say that God is still in control. But I come with a warning tonight. There is no fulfilling of a prophetic assignment without an antagonistic reality that seeks to keep you from walking in it. You will not walk in assignment without antagonism. As a matter of fact, many times the antagonism becomes the confirmation of the assignment. <laughs> Sometimes the confirmation of the assignment isn't the love offering, it isn't the folk that's shouting, not the folk that's running, but sometimes the confirmation of your assignment are the people that come against you and the things that you have to deal with. You've got to learn to be mature enough to not only handle the assignment, but manage the antagonism that comes with the assignment because the victory shout should not just be about what you accomplish, but the shout should also be about what you conquered. You shouldn't just shout about what you did, but you ought to be able to shout about everything you overcame. Listen to me tonight. Every assignment comes with an assassin. And I know it's true, because after Elijah speaks, God says, hide yourself. The inference is, standing on my word made somebody mad. And now I've got to hide you so the folk that don't like you can't get to you. Last night he was a keeper, but does anybody know he'll hide you tonight? I, I, this is not for everybody, but is there anybody tonight that knows he'll hide you in the cleft of the rock? He'll hide you so that people can't find you. See, when you begin to challenge the status quo and challenge people's level of comfort, it won't sit well with everybody. Every week ought not be a shouting week. 
I know y'all not going to say much tonight. Every week ought not be a kill them week and a shut it down week and a ran everybody week. If everybody is pleased with you and your preaching and your ministry, then something in right. Because your prophetic pronouncement is going to cause you problems with some people whose lifestyle your prophecy puts in question. Standing on God's word is going to cause you problems. It'll have governors asking you to submit your sermons for theological and social scrutiny. It will have parishioners writing you letters of discontent when your word pushes against their dysfunctions. And you've got to be strong enough to stand in the midst of every assassin that's trying to take you out and preach God's word knowing that in the time of trouble, he he will hide. How do you remain faithful within the confines of the madness of ministry when folk don't like your prophetic ministry? Here, here, here's one thing. My theology births my audacity. I, I'm brave because of what I think about God. The, the wording of Elijah within the context of the conversation is very powerful. I need to paint the picture. He's standing in the presence of the king. Watch this. Who has soldiers that report to him are accountable to him and stand before him. They stand before him to do what he says to be done and to make sure he is pleased. With that in mind, watch what Elijah says. As surely as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. Y'all missed it. Come back again. He's talking to a king who's used to having folk that stand before him to do what he says. He's used to having people stand before him to make sure he is pleased. But here's what Elijah is saying. I'm in front of you, but I ain't standing before you. I stand before the Lord my God. And don't get it twisted, Ahab. Your soldiers stand before you, but I don't stand before you. I stand before the Lord my God. And the only one I have to answer to is the one that I stand before. I don't stand before you I stand before the Lord others may report to you others may have to do what you say others may care about your opinion but I ain't in your army I stand before the Lord God I wish I had a witness in here that that's something you have to be convicted about you don't stand before your deacon You, you don't stand before your givers, Jesus. You, you don't stand before other preachers. You stand before the Lord your God. When you know who you really stand before, you won't write cute sermons not to make folk mad. You won't get upset when they sit with their arms folded and their legs crossed. Because when you know you stand before God, what they think about you has no effect on you because they didn't call you and they can't cancel you. And if your liking me didn't make me, your criticizing me can't kill me. I wish you'd tell somebody, I stand before the Lord. Th that's why I preach like I preach. That's why I act like I act. That's why I say what I say. I don't stand before the president. I don't stand before Congress. I stand before. And is there anybody in here tonight that can say, when I'm done with everything God called me to do, I want to hear him say, servant, well done. I know you had to be in front of other people, but you were faithful. Look at what he says. I don't stand before you. I stand before the Lord who is alive.
the God you've been serving is dead. <laughs> but I talk like I talk because the God I serve is alive. And I know this is happening and some of y'all waiting on me to say something theologically deep and gonna have something to say because it wasn't theologically deep. But for just a few minutes, let the profundity be in simplicity. Is there anybody tonight that's glad God is alive? Is there anybody tonight that can look down the corridor of your life and you got evidence that God is alive? He woke you up this morning. He kept you all day long. He made your enemies your footstool. It's the evidence that God is. I dare you to shake somebody's hand and tell them God is alive. Yes, you, you ought to talk like you know he's alive. You ought to dream like you know he's alive. Because when I know he's alive, there's nothing I can't accomplish. There's nothing we can't do. Because he's alive, I've got unlimited faith and limitless possibilities. Because he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all I could ask. I dare you to shake somebody's hand and tell them the God. God I serve is alive. You ought to preach like he's alive. You ought to shout like he's alive. You ought to smile like he's alive. You ought to wave your hand like he. My theology births my audacity. I might be in front of you, but I stand before him. Something else, the sufficiency of provision is always tied to a place. Notice the particularity of the words in the text. Go east to the brook, <laughs> and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. I, I'm omnipotent, so I could bring them to you. <laughs> Jesus. But I'm not going to bring them to you because you got to be faithful to where I send you to get what I want you to have. Go to the brook. I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. The record records he turned to the east and went to the brook. Now here is what messed me up. Bishop Thomas went to a map and I noticed something. I noticed um, that to go east to the brook, Jesus, there are two other bodies of water. Jesus, help me tonight. There, there is an ocean <laughs> and there's a river. God help me. So. I went and did a little deeper study and I discovered that he's only 26 miles from an ocean. He's only five miles from the Jordan River and God makes him pass the river and the ocean and go to the brook. And Jamal, here was my question. Why would God, Jesus, send me to a brook when an ocean and a river are available? God help me tonight. Um, the brook is the smallest body of water. So more than enough is all around him, and yet God sends him to barely enough. Can you be faithful to the place God sends you even when bigger is in with proximity to you? I know everybody ain't going to say nothing now because the blessing is not always being in the bigger place. It's being in the right place. 
because greatness ain't in bigger. Greatness is in placement. I'm trying to help somebody tonight. The right place might not be the bigger place, but by comparison, it's the right place because it's where God told you to go. I'm finna get in trouble. Because the reason preachers are the biggest haters of each other is because we're too busy comparing instead of being satisfied where God sends me. So you dressing like an ocean with brook money. You're mad with the brother or the sister that's got the ocean church because you got the brook church and now you don't get along. You got something to say about everything he or she does. You're always critiquing everything you do, but you got to get to the point where you say it ain't the ocean, but I thank God for the brook. It ain't the biggest thing out there, but it's mine. There's bigger all around me, but this is what God gave me. Is there anybody tonight who can say I ain't got the biggest check but I'm shouting because I got one I ain't got the biggest house but I'm shouting because I got one I ain't driving the Bentley but I'm shouting because I got something you ought to be shouting tonight that God gave you something I dare you to high five somebody and tell them yours might be bigger but mine got my name on it Is there anybody in here who can shout over where God has you and thank God for the brook? Yes. You. Don't you frown on your degree because you went to Bible college and didn't make it to Harvard. That's your brook. Don't you be upset because you passed the 200 people and they passed the 2,000. That's your brook. And you ought to be saying, God, I thank you because there's some folk ain't got nothing. There's some people got to YouTube every week. Thank you for my brook. And this week, you're going to run into some ocean and river dwellers. But walk away and shout at your brook if that's where God sent you because I've seen sharks in oceans and maybe God didn't give you a shark defeating anointing you got to be thankful for where God has you I don't know who I'm talking to Tap your application. You send it to that church just because it's bigger. Don't always think it's God because an ocean came available. He sent you to the brook. Sit down. Just nudge your neighbor and tell them I'm shouting over my brook tonight. I'm, that was the wrong neighbor. They're trying to be fake and phony. Nudge somebody else and tell them I'm shouting over my brook tonight. At least I got a roof over my head. My bills are paid. I got folk that love me. I sleep good at night. I got peace of mind. I'm shouting over my brook. I got one more thing to tell you. You have to learn how not to worry while you wait. Okay. 
There's something in this text we've been missing. And it's implied in the very words of the text. Elijah goes to where God instructs him to go. Then we say, we see this phrase that has become the, the famous point of preaching. Sometime later, the brook dried up. And so that's, that's what we, we've been talking about. When the brook dries up. I need you to get the picture of the implications of the words. Sometime later, <laughs> the brook dried up. So, Claude, if you put yourself in the place of Elijah, here you are, avoiding a drought, hiding from Ahab because of where God sends you. He sends you to the smallest body of water available and made you walk by two that had more water in it. He sends you to this water to keep you hydrated. And as I said, we can't, everybody in his probably preached what to do when the brook dried up. But please understand tonight, something drying up doesn't happen all at once. It happens over the course of time. So here's Elijah every day waking up at the brook, seeing less of it today than he saw yesterday, Jesus. He wakes up the next day, seeing less of it than he saw the day before. He, he thinks maybe his eyes are messing with him, so he puts a stick in the water to see if tomorrow it's going to be lower than it was today. And he wakes up tomorrow, and the water's lower than it was the day before. And God ain't saying nothing. We always preach what to do when the brook dries up. But here's my question. What do you do when you gotta watch your supply diminish every day without the ability to change it? Jesus. How am I not supposed to worry when the place God sends me and the resource God supplied for me is running out. And this is important because for some of us tonight, for some of you in your churches or in your ministry or in your family or in your home or in your finances or in your business, things aren't dry yet, but they run it out. And you're anxious because every day you see it running out. You got the trustee report and the money ain't what it used to be. It ain't dried up, but it's <laughs> running out. You walk out to the pulpit and this week the crowd is less than it was last week. It ain't, Jesus, it ain't dried up, but it's running out. Folk not coming to Bible study and committed to ministry like they used to be. It ain't, it ain't dried up. But it's running out. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, you're too good an exegete to fall for that. I said, what do you mean, Holy Spirit? He said, I never told him I was supplying water. I told him I was supplying ravens. God, y'all didn't get it. So even if the water runs out, the ravens are still coming. I need somebody to shout tonight who's thankful everything don't fall apart at the same time. And when the water runs out, God is still sending you and providing for you everything. Is there anybody tonight who can say the water's running out, but the ravens are still coming? He's still feeding me. He's still supplying.
dying for me. He's still lifting me. He's still sustaining me. So instead of worrying about running out, take a minute to be thankful for what you got left and shake three people's hand and tell them, here's the phrase for tonight. The ravens are coming. The ravens are coming. You ain't got the money, but the ravens are coming. You don't know how you're going to get it, but the ravens are coming. God is still making a way. I dare you to find three people and tell them the ravens are coming. Your raven might be somebody with a kind word. Your raven might be somebody sowing into your life. Your raven might be God giving you a good night's sleep. Your raven might be somebody helping you out. But I dare you to wave your hand and say the ravens are coming. The raven. He said, I'm going to sustain you through this season of recession. The brook dries up, Jamal, in verse 7. 7. is the number of completion. God ain't going to let nothing run out until you have completed everything he sent you there to do. So I don't care who leaves your church. I don't care who walks away from you. You go to that pulpit and you say the ravens are coming. God's going to make a way out of no way. He's going to provide out of nowhere. He's going to open a door I didn't see. The right now here is what messed me up. And I'm done. According to the book of Leviticus, ravens are unclean, impure, not to be eaten by people. Nothing connected to them can the people of God eat. They're unclean, impure. Y'all don't even see the corner I'm going to turn. God says, I'm going to use something and put your sustenance in an unclean mouth to feed you. So sometimes, God help me tonight, I'm not the one at the brook waiting, but as the preacher, I'm the raven that God is sending. Y'all didn't get it. Every Sunday when you stand, you ought to stand with joy that God took you with your unclean, imperfect self and put food in your mouth to feed people in the sanctuary who come because their brooks are drying up. And the reason you ought to shout tonight is because in spite of you, he's using you. In spite of your imperfection, he's using you. In spite of your flaws, he's using you. People ask me all the time, why you got to act like you act? You got a master's from Virginia Union. You got an opera degree, which means you ought to be filled with sophistry. You got a doctoral degree under Charles Booth and Sam Proctor. You ought to preach more refined than you do. And I have to tell them because I'm a raven. And I know I'm imperfect. And I know I've messed up. And every time I stand up, I got to say, God, I thank you that you put your perfect food in an imperfect mouth. Would you shake somebody's hand and tell them I'm shouting tonight because I'm a raven. No, I ain't Elijah tonight. I'm the one God is using. I'm the one God is fixing with my imperfect self, with my unholy self, with my unclean self. See, folk don't want to shout over this, but you ought to thank God tonight that
that in spite of all your ways, he keeps on using you. In spite of all your flaws, he keeps on using you. See, if I was telling you he was going to give you a house, and if I was telling you you got a car, you'd be running around this building, you'd be jumping over the balcony, you'd be hollering, preach Rudy, but I'm looking for a few folk tonight who can say my shout tonight is because I know I don't deserve it. I know he shouldn't use me, but he uses me in spite of my imperfections. He uses me with all the mess in my life. He uses me even though I messed over my wife. He uses me even though I've been high as a kite. He uses me even though I've been drunk as a skunk. And I don't think I'm the only one in here would you take a neighbor by the hand and tell your neighbor neighbor my name ain't reverend my name ain't doctor my name ain't bishop my name ain't apostle my name is raven because God uses me with my messed up self he uses me with my imperfect self he uses me with my unclean self is there anybody tonight who can wave your hand and thank God that he uses you? So when folk tell you what you did, tell them thank you for reminding me I'm a raven. I'm messed up and I'm jacked up. But I can say tonight that he cleaned me up so that he could use me. He took my unclean self and washed me in his blood. What can and wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, I said, oh, ah, precious. Is that flow that makes me white as snow? Has he cleaned you up? Then thank him for the blood. Has he washed you up? Then thank him for the blood. It reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. I'm looking for the sanctified folk. I know it was the blood. One day. When I was lost, he died, didn't he die, upon that cross. Shake your neighbor's hand and tell your neighbor, neighbor, oh, neighbor, he cleaned me up. That was the wrong neighbor. Turn on the other side, take a neighbor by the hand, shake him and rock him, rock him and shake him. Shake them and rock them and tell them, neighbor, <laughs> neighbor, <laughs> he cleaned me up. Anybody know he'll clean you? Anybody know he'll use you? Anybody know he'll sanctify you? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he fight your battles? Won't he make your enemies your footstool? Won't he give you joy and sorrow? Won't he give you hope for tomorrow? Won't he dry your tears? Won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he? Won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he? And because I know I don't deserve it. Because I know I didn't earn it. I got to give him praise for using me. I got to lift him up for giving me a chance. And is there anybody in this place tonight that can flap your hands? Cause you're a raven. You can lift up your hands cause you're a raven. And 
open up your mouth and say, anyway, you want to use me. Use me for your service. Use me for your pleasure. Now somebody scream because he's using you. Somebody holler because he's using you with your broke down self, with your imperfect self, with your unclean self, with your brook dwelling self, with your raven smelling self, with your nasty self. Shake your neighbor's hand and say, thank God he's using you. Thank God he's using you. He's using you to bring sight to the blind. He's using you to set the captive free. He's using you to lay hands on the sick. He's using you to save marriages. He's using you to deliver children. Is there anybody who can get out of your seat? And I dare you to bum rush this altar and say, I'm a raven. I came here as a preacher, but I'm leaving as a raven. I came here as a doctor, but I'm leaving here as a raven. Yes, yes. Somebody say Bow your heads right where you are. Eyes closed. As we just delight in the glorious presence of the Lord. Just see yourself with the wings flapping. Carrying the good news of Jesus Christ to a dying world. And the good news is we come to the close of another day that if we keep on being faithful to God 
as ravens carrying the word that some glad morning when this old life is over we're going to fly away Thank you for your servant, Bishop Rudolph McKissick, one more time tonight, God. Thank you. That has been a great day. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be with us and give us inner peace. And the people of God said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. We'll see you in the morning by the grace of God.